Hi, I'm Erna Bell DeMillo. Welcome to Asian American Life. In this edition, I sat down with a young star of the hit TV show, Fresh Off the Boat, to talk about his life-changing role and why the show is a success. Plus, we have this. Paul Lin enjoys a modern opera on Hollywood TV and film. Minnie Rowe gets into action with superheroes. And Kyung Yoon learns how to turn an entrepreneurial dream into reality. We begin our show with Fresh Off the Boat, the history-making sitcom on ABC television. Variety magazine reports that diversity sells, and Hollywood is finally responding with hit shows like this one. Let's take a look. That's me, your boy Eddie Wong, check it, 11 years old and moving from D.C. to Orlando. And so begins the adventure for Eddie and his family, and for the boy playing Eddie in ABC's new sitcom, Fresh Off the Boat. Meet 11-year-old Hudson Yang, who on a whim declared to his family he wanted to be an actor. I thought I was going to do one thing, see how it was, and then go back home and be normal again. <laughs> I didn't think that it would lead to this. But now that I'm doing something like really big or something amazing or cool, or I don't know how to explain it. It's just really fun. Fresh Off the Boat is the first sitcom featuring an Asian American cast in 20 years. Back in 1994, comedian Margaret Cho starred in All American Girl, which was panned by Asian Americans and critics alike, including, ironically, Hudson's dad. Jeff Yang, a cultural critic and columnist for the Wall Street Journal, was a young reporter for the Village Voice who was assigned to review All American Girl. The fact that they wanted me to review this felt uncomfortable to me. If you're Asian American, uh, it's so hard to get coverage of any sort. And Asian American journalists have a special responsibility, it feels like sometimes, to shed that lens. Later, Cho blamed Yang's critique as one reason why her show was canceled. Margaret uh, furiously told me that that review was going to end up being a key element in the cancellation of the show, that if they wanted to pull the rug out, they would in part use the blame that the community was not supporting the show. Yang says he regrets writing the review, especially because it took 20 years for the networks to give the green light to a show with an all Asian American cast. This time, the reviews and the community have been kinder. Even Eddie Huang, who openly criticized the writers and producers for sanitizing his story, has come around, praising the pilot. The celebrity chef and best-selling author showed up at the Standing Room Only premiere screening in New York. It was so popular, organizers had to turn away hundreds of people at the door. I think we were really at the cusp of a unique moment in Asian American media history. And it maybe it did take 20 years of, of absence for this to happen, 20 years in which we grew as a community. If Fresh Off the Boat proves successful, it could benefit other shows featuring Asian Americans. ABC just gave Ken Jeong the green light to produce and star in the comedy Dr. Ken. In fact, a recent study out of UCLA has shown that audiences are hungry for shows with diverse casts. Shows like Empire, Scandal, Jane the Virgin, just to name a few, have done really well in the ratings. Many agree there is a lot riding on Fresh Off the Boat and on the cast's shoulders. Asian Americans don't want another 20-year drought. The show, in another karmic twist, is set in the 1990s when All American Girl premiered. It's loosely based on Eddie Huang's childhood in a predominantly white neighborhood in Orlando, Florida. Randall Park plays Eddie's amiable dad, and Constance Wu stars as his mom. I want to go back to D.C. We are here now. We have to make the best of it. You think I like pretending Samantha isn't carrying a baggie of dog poops in her hand? The show, which has several Asian Americans also working behind the scenes as writers and producer, has its laugh-out-loud sitcom moments but it also dares to push the envelope. For example, they have already, in the first episode, tackled the word chink. Yang, who grew up in Staten Island, can relate to many of the storylines. I do definitely uh, empathize, especially with some of the things you see in the pilot, right? Uh, perhaps most critically, I remember bringing to school food that my, kid, my fellow you know, students thought was bizarre and disgusting, and uh, having to eat by myself because of that. White Until lunch. I finally told my parents, I want white people lunch. <laughs> but for Hudson, who grew up in Brooklyn, it's a different world and a different narrative. Were you ever treated differently when you were 
in school or now in school because you're Asian? Not at all. I mean, there are some points where they didn't, they weren't mean to me because I was Asian, but they're like nicer to me because I was Asian. I felt for a while like Asian America was ripe for this. Like we were getting to a point where there was just way too much water behind the dam for something to not finally break through. Now we're ready. We're ready to see what happens next. And not just for fresh off the boat, but I think for hopefully the, the fusillade of uh, Asian American shows and movies and, and stars to come after. Fresh Off the Boat continues to grow in popularity with that all-important demographic, the 18 to 49-year-old viewers. Imagine an opera based on the Silence of the Lambs serial killer, Hannibal Lecter. Well, Paul Lin meets with the composer of One World Symphony, who turns pop culture into performing arts. The Church of the Holy Apostles in Manhattan is home to One World Symphony. Yes, it's an orchestra with a conductor and soloist, but if you think this is classical music and that's not your thing, prepare to be blown away. The One World experience, in a word, is democratic. Everyone sits on the same floor in close. There's no stage, no stuffy attitude. There's also the energy South Korean-born Sung Jin Hong brings both to musicians and the audience. Energy and a tangible connection. Too many conductors, I think, this is how they begin. I'm, I'm going to start. And then they look at the music instead of and then breathe and make that connection, breathe with, with your fellow music, musicians. We caught up with Sung Jin and wife soprano Adrian Metzinger at their Brooklyn apartment to find out why One World has changed the way people think about classical music. We get people involved. It's, there's no intermission. You just keep going and going. And, and uh, we get everybody. It's a more immersive experience. So why not a little tap dancing during your orchestral performance? That happened at a concert themed around the TV show The Bachelor, complete with women vying for the attention of a contestant through tap and song. Only this night, everyone gets a rose. We really try to frame everything, um, frame uh, symphony and opera in a way that it can resonate with, um, with today's audience, today's you know, public. One World got its start in 2001. Sung Jin and Adrian had already been planning a concert before 9-11. After the attacks, they felt compelled to do something for a city devastated by terrorism. It helped us build some sort of a, um, I wouldn't say identity, but a sense of purpose because uh, we thought we were uh, contributing towards our local community. One World contributed the proceeds of that first concert to the Firefighters, Widows, and Children's Fund and has donated proceeds ever since to organizations around the world that do good work. One World's other mission can be seen as a kind of musical outreach. That includes encouraging people to really be a part of the show. One World helps people tap into music that has lived for centuries. The feisty women, the romance and drama of opera, dark stories and battles for power just like hit TV shows today. That realization got Sung Jin inspired to write his first opera based on Breaking Bad. And within an hour of us making it live on our website, Time Magazine had posted it to their website. By the end of that day, it just, it just went crazy. <laughs> When the premiere of Breaking Bad Ozymandias, the opera, was sold out, Sung Jin and Adrian knew they were on to something. People actually lining up on the street, waiting to hear the new opera. After that success, the trademark term, opera sode, was born. Which brings us to the new opera Sung Jin's composing, based on the TV show Hannibal. Hannibal will be my second opera after Breaking Bad Ozymandias. And it's inspired by uh, probably the most notorious serial killer, Hannibal Lecter. So how does one set music to a story about the infamous fictional serial killer, Hannibal Lecter? Sung Jin begins with a line of dialogue from one of the episodes. Hannibal asks Will, what do you hear? And Will responds, responds with carbon, orchestrations of carbon. 
Carbon is a building block for life, so Sung Jin takes that as a departure point for composing the opera, choosing letters from the word carbon that also happen to be musical notes. I chose the notes C and C, A, and B from carbon, and if you mix those notes, juxtapose them, um, you get the, the sonorities and, and even, even the aroma of those sounds. Right? incredibly intriguing and, and sensual. People say, oh, classical music is dying and stuff. People are, the musicians don't care about the audience. Here, this is the reason why I, I'm taking off the ritual. Okay, so let's practice it again. Just will yourself to really enjoy. If you have to, I mean, seriously. Okay, here we go. Here we go. People, especially in New York City, have so many options vying for their time and attention, which is why Sung Jin and Adrian want their audience to have the best time at One World's concerts. For much of the week, the space inside where One World performs serves as New York's largest soup kitchen, and One World often donates concert proceeds to help feed this community, providing hot meals for some of New York's hungriest. I'm Paul Lin for Asian American Life. I'm Minnie Rowe. In a world of superheroes, traditionally white and male like Captain America, Superman, and Batman, you'd be surprised to learn that the authors who breathe life into these characters are anything but. These icons are as familiar to us as butter toast. Action figures capable of death-defying feats like shimmying up building walls or soaring through the sky. But what is not as widely known is that some of the authors penning these beloved characters have names like Hama, Chu, and Pak. They are Asian American, and they are helping to change the landscape of the industry from the inside out. The more diverse your writing staff gets, the, the more you know interesting stuff you can do. Greg Bach is a freelance writer for publishing powerhouses like DC and Marvel Comics and has written The Incredible Hulk, Batman, and most recently, Superman, to name a few. I'm writing Superman. Superman's an immigrant. You know, he comes from planet Krypton. He doesn't belong. He's always struggling to kind of, and he's, 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 by, he's navigating multiple cultures and figuring out where, you know, what his role is. As a writer, Pak has the ability to incorporate diverse characters into his comics, like Wong in the Doctor Strange series, and Amadeus Cho, the Incredible Hulk's number one fan, a super genius who happens to be Korean-American. When I pitched the idea of doing this Korean-American kid, I never had that moment where people said, mm, does he have to be Korean? Or, you know, that will happen in the film industry. Never ever has had that ever happened in comics. He enjoys it. Thank you. And but I'm glad to know that we have a comics author. With Amy Chu is a rising star in the comic book industry, a former Asian American activist turned businesswoman, turned comic book writer. She says she never dreamed this world was for her. But then it all changed after taking an online writing course. I produced what became my first published comic, you know. Um, so I did the story and people liked it. And, and that's kind of a revelation for someone like me who's kind of done business or management all my life. After discovering a hidden passion, she went on to self-published titles like Saving Abby and Girls' Night Out, stories that would appeal to everyone, but particularly a female audience. Soon she found herself freelancing for established labels like Vertigo and DC Comics and writing about the adventures of the most recognizable female character, Wonder Woman. 
I do want to show there's diversity. When I write stories, I am acutely aware of ethnicity and uh, gender bias and things like that. So that definitely enters into the story. In the past, color simply referred to the hues that filled in the pages of a comic book. Then, a few decades ago, thanks to an ethnically diverse pool of writers and editors, a new breed of superheroes was born that no longer fit the mold. For example, take Cindy Moon, or Silk. She's an Asian American who developed superpowers after being bitten by a radioactive spider. Kamala Khan, aka Miss Marvel, a Pakistani Muslim American from New Jersey. Turok is a Native American dinosaur hunter. There's Storm, the leader of the X-Men, who started life as the daughter of a Kenyan princess. People have created diverse characters in comics for decades, um, and uh, I think it's easier in comics because there are fewer people breathing down your neck. Pak and Chu say a lot of the credit of shattering the glass ceiling to the formerly white male-dominated world of comic book writing goes to Larry Hama, a Japanese-American author with a cult-like following for his work on G.I. Joe. In the comics world, Larry Hama is one of those people who, you know, from the beginning was getting in there and, you know, in places where somebody like him had not traditionally been and, uh, and making it all work. When he introduces female characters or Asian characters, these are real characters that everyone loves. And it's not like, okay, I'm going to wave a flag in your face. I'm going to put an Asian American character in there, and there you go. He does it so seamlessly, people don't even know they've been co-opted into a progressive kind of agenda. It's wonderful. Chu says, personally, she tries to stay away from creating characters just for the sake of diversity. But she admits she does feel a sense of responsibility to be a watchdog for her industry from behind the scenes. Now it's kind of embedded in that, like, oh my god, I just read the worst comic where I'm like, I'm looking at the Chinatown this guy drew, and it's like paper lanterns in the streets. I'm like, this is a community, dude, you know? And I'm not going to be out there, like, pounding my fist. In, but I want every reader to know that that's not, even if it's a fantasy, it's a racist fantasy, you know? And let's, let's, let's change that by me being in the industry, other people being in the industry. At the end of the day, these writers say they just want to create a world, yes, even a fantasy one, that is a mirror image of the world in which we all live. And the world in which we live is more and more diverse every day. And, you know, putting that lived experience in the books is, uh, is what we should be doing. That's what's, what makes them live and breathe and makes people care. So hope I can keep doing that. Several years ago, the first Asian American Comic Con was held in New York City. Hundreds attended the day-long event, which explored the role of Asians and Asian Americans in graphic fiction. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. Kyung Yoon. In today's On the Move, we meet an entrepreneur who's putting a new face to science and skin care. Well, I came to the United States at age 12. Um, it was the January of 1971. It's been a long road for David Chung since arriving from Korea as a sixth grader who couldn't speak a word of English to becoming a successful executive in the highly competitive business of beauty and skin care. I think the beauty is, uh, business is going to be always going to be there, no matter whether it's a recession or whether the market is good or bad, or even with the different technologies around. But I think the beauty will always be there. That's why David and his wife Erica embarked on building their own luxury skincare line called 3Lab, as well as a bustling manufacturing and research and development facility in New Jersey that produces more than 80 well known beauty brands and is a $100 million skincare business. I majored in engineering school, 
But pigeons was in my blood. It was my, in my DNA. David's mother, Judy Chung, had been the first in the family to make the long journey halfway around the world to Queens, New York. When she left Korea in 1964, it was a poor country still reeling from the devastation of the Korean War. When she landed at JFK Airport, Judy Chung had $100 to her name and dreams of a better life for herself and her children. I worked in company, a trading company, 9 to 5. And after 5.30 to 11, I worked in New York Life Insurance. So I had two jobs. The hardworking mother finally saved enough money to bring over the children she had left behind in Korea. A couple years after the family was reunited, she opened a small shop in Manhattan's West 32nd Street in 1973. It was the first Korean store in a neighborhood that today has been transformed into New York City's Koreatown. David worked at the store after school during his junior high and high school years. He recalls that stretch of 32nd Street as being a far different and dangerous place from Koreatown today. I remember as a young kid, we get robbed all the time. It was the most dangerous place to go, you know. And if you park your car within two seconds, they will open up the trunk and take everything. You have to twice working hard than other people. Other people working eight hours. At least you work 15 hours, nothing to lose. <laughs> The hard work paid off when David and his wife started their own skincare brand called 3Lab in 2003. We decided to come up with our own brand. So there are 3Lab was born, and I am in charge of a 3Lab brand. In the beginning when we started 3Lab, we were looking for a um, research and development company, a contract manufacturing company to work with us to develop the yeah, skincare line. I decided to uh, create my own company to do it and do my own research and development and manufacturing. And that somehow was born a company called Ingo Lab. David is a perfectionist. Uh, everything should be done in a way that he wishes to. So we all have to deliver to his satisfactory. I am personally bring all my resource investment back into a uh, research and development of skincare, mainly skincare, uh, and always continue to look for interesting ingredients that's around the world and actually working together with the different ingredients to make the uh, skincare very unique. What started as a dream for David and Erica Chung is now a skincare company that employs hundreds of people in Englewood, New Jersey, and with their own brand sold worldwide. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. I just thought it was so fascinating to meet David Chung, but also his mother, the fact that she's 85 years old. She was, had the first store in Koreatown, you know, on West 32nd Street in Manhattan. And just to see where this boy, as a teenager, kind of learned about how to pack things, how to do, mm -hmm. run a retail business, but he also learned about the value of hard work and then kind of took his, that mom and pop store and has really taken it to a whole different level. Kind of breaking the mold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, my story too, these writers also broke the mold. You know, Greg Pak, he started out as a film writer. He was a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. Amy Chu is a fascinating woman. She was a Asian American activist. Then she went to Harvard Business School, mm -hmm. went into biotech. Wow. And then one day she said, I think I'm just gonna go into comic book writing. And she's this very successful comic book writer has created a lot of good, strong female characters. You know, it's, it's really refreshing to see that. You know, what's so interesting about this, um, when you talk about Asian Americans pursuing the arts and entertainment, you're really seeing obviously a lot more on, um, in front of the camera, but there's so much going on behind the scenes too. Um, when I was talking to Jeff Yang, whose son is the star of Fresh Off the Boat, he said in the writing room, there are Asian American writers. There's an Asian American director, a producer, and you're really starting to see the change from within, and I think that's really gonna really, really sh uh, reflect later on when you see more shows with diverse casts. And these shows, these shows are all doing well, including Fresh Off the Boat. I hope you guys are all watching. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah that's great. <laughs> 
<laughs> it really makes me think, you know, perhaps they might even do something with this. This is a popular culture phenomenon now to have Asian Americans on a TV show that's, you know, prime time. And, uh, you know, maybe they could even do something like, could they make an opera out of this? This is not too far out of the way. And breaking the mold is something that the One World Symphony has been doing, making operas and sort of pairing them with popular culture. That's our show for now. Be sure to tune in next month when we profile inspiring leaders who have paved the way for Asian Americans. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Asian American Life. <laughs>